We all remember the greatest common divisor from elementary school because we would get it from numbers like 24 and 16. But now what do we do when we're trying to find the greatest common de divisor of a number like 504 and let's say 945? Not only do these numbers have lots of divisors, but it would also take forever to figure out what they are. Because of this, Euclid came up with a clever process and what I'm going to do is I'm going to first just give an example. We're going to do this example together and then we're going to explain why this process works with a general form. And then at the very end, I'm going to show you how we can program this into a program to do it for us, because that is the main purpose of algorithms in our modern world. It's so that we can program it in a program and have that do the work for us. We're going to divide 945 by 504. We're going to be finding the quotient, and we're going to be finding the remainder. 945 minus 504 is 441, so that means that 945 is equal to 1 times 504 plus 441. Our next step is going to be taking 504 and writing that in terms of 441. That is 1 times 441 plus 63. Now we're going to do the same thing one last time and we're going to find 441 in terms of 63. 441 is equal to 7 times 63 plus 0. This is important. It has a remainder of 0, so the greatest common divisor is 63. Now that probably just looks like a bunch of mumbo jumbo, so we're going to write this out in a general form and prove this. We're going to be finding the GCD of A comma B, and we're going to be writing these with respect to quotients and remainders. A is equal to Q0 times B plus R0. B is equal to Q sub 1 times R0 plus R sub 1. Then R0 is equal to Q sub 2 times R sub 1 plus R sub 2. Then we can solve for R sub 1. And that is equal to Q sub 3 times R sub 2 plus R sub 3. We're eventually going to get a remainder of 0, and that is going to say that R sub n minus 1 is our answer. But this still is leaving us asking the question, why? If r sub n minus 1 is going to be our GCD, I want to go back and replace it with that because that's an easier variable to understand. So at this point, we're going to be proving that GCD is a factor of a and b. If we can prove that it's a multiple of every value of r, that will include a and b, and then it's by definition the GCD. What we know now is that r sub n minus 2 is some quotient, some integer value times the greatest common denominator with no remainder. So I've just copied and pasted r sub n minus 3 and I wanted to do that because we have an r sub n minus 2 term. We just said that r sub n minus 2 is cube sub n times gcd. What we can now do is we can now factor out that gcd to give us that r sub n minus 3 is q sub n minus 1 plus 1 times gcd. That gives us a q sub n minus 1, that some integer quotient is being added to 1, another integer. That gives us that r sub n minus 3 is some integer times the gcd, which means that it's also a multiple. We can then replace r sub n minus 3 in the previous equation, and then we can add the next quotient, and we can just keep on adding these ones. So now, more or less, this means that every subsequent r value can be written in terms of some quotient plus some integer times the GCD, meaning that a and b are both multiples. Of the reason that this is a GCD, or the greatest common denominator, is because we end this process as soon as it is equal to zero, and so we truncate before we find any other multiples. Now this is a recursive equation, and the best thing you can do with a recursive equation is program it because they are easy to program and very efficient. Now I don't want you to worry about syntax. If you've never seen a code before, I'm just going to explain the idea of writing this in a recursive form to solve this. One thing you need to know about programming is that we call this section the main, and what this does is it takes in all of the user input and it sends it down to what we call methods down here. System.out.print essentially means you're just going to display what is inside the quotation. So it's going to ask you to insert the first number. Then you're going to have an integer called a. That's the number you type in. Then it's going to ask for a second number. And then it's going to take that as an integer called b. Now there are three cases here. 
either A is greater than B, B is greater than A, or they are equal. So I have this method here called Euclidean, and this is going to take in R and R sub 1. I have written this program such that R is always greater than R sub 1. So if A is greater, then it's A comma B. If B is greater, then it's B comma A, because the program takes it in, the integers in that particular order. If they are the same, then the greatest common denominator is merely that number, because they are the same number. Therefore, we don't need to do any more math. Okay, so now to the fun part. So now we're going to have some integer Q, because that's an important part. And we're going to have an R2 value, because remember, there are three R values in every single iteration. Now this looks like some mumbo jumbo right here, so let's go see what it's doing. We'll notice that R sub 2 is then equal to R0 minus Q sub 2 times R sub 1. This means that we can use the two previous terms to find R sub 2. Now we've set this equation such that A is greater than B, so therefore B is greater than R0, and R0 is greater than R sub 1. So R sub 2 here is how many times we're multiplying R sub 1 so that it gets close to R0 but does not exceed it, because that's more or less what we're trying to do here. So if we look back at the program, what I've done here is I've written a program called Quotient. If you're not familiar with programming, I wouldn't bother about this, but if you are, what this essentially does is it takes in two parameters and it sends it back to the other with an n value of zero. We're given that a is greater than b, so we're going to subtract b from a. If that value is greater than zero, then we're going to increase our n value, and we're going to just repeat this process. So we're going to take the quotient of a minus b, comma b, with n. n plus plus essentially means we're adding 1 to n. We're going to keep subtracting b until a minus b times n plus 1 is less than zero because n plus 1 times b is less than 0, we're not going to iterate it, and we're just going to return n. That's the number of times we multiply b so that it's close to a, but does not exceed it. Now, if we go back up to the program, we've called this integer q. It's equal to the quotient of r comma r sub 1, where r is greater than r sub 1. That's our precondition. And using the formula we came up with over here, we have r sub 2 is equal to r minus r sub 1 times q. Now, if q is 0, if the quotient is 0, we're going to be returning r sub 1. Because remember earlier, we came up with an equation where the middle variable is the one that is the greatest common denominator when the quotient is 0. What a return does is that's the number that it sends up here when we call that method. So if q is not equal to 0, what we're then going to return is Euclidean of r1, comma r2. Now wait, this is inside the method called Euclidean. We'll notice that this is a recursive formula where we have the same variable being solved for in different equations. Because of that, we're essentially using the same process to find a variable until we hit a certain scenario. In this case, the scenario is at q equals 0. So we're going to keep returning Euclidean of r sub 1 comma r sub 2, where r sub 1 is greater than r sub 2, until q is equal to 0, and we're going to return r sub 1. Now, trusting that my syntax is correct, we can just add in something like 24 and 16, the problem we started with to check that it's right, and it gives us 8. That's the right answer. So after we figure it out what q is and what r sub 2 is, I'm going to have my program print out what r is, what r sub 1 is, what r sub 2 is, and what q is. What this will then tell us is it will show us the pattern right there. What we're going to do is we're going to take two big numbers like 312 and 1105 because these are going to go through multiple iterations. Aha! The greatest common divisor is 13 after, let's see, six different iterations. One thing I really like is the beautiful pattern where we see 312 moves down, then we see 169 in this row, 143 in this diagonal, 26 in this diagonal, 13 in this diagonal, and then we'll notice that 13 appears all over the place in the bottom because that is the greatest common divisor. What we can also see is that 169 plus 3 times 312 is 1105. We can see that 1 times 169 plus 143 is 312, we can keep doing this process. We have 5 times 26 plus 13 is 143. And then, of course, we have 0 times 13 plus 13 is 13. Therefore, 13 is the greatest common divisor.
What I really love about this is that we can now take a big number like 19,320 and 58,786 and it can now iterate it in just a few short steps and give us 14. This is math I would never want to do, but with this program, it can simply just use this, the same lines of code over and over and over to figure out what this answer is, very simply. <laughs> now the very last thing that I want to touch on is what happens when the numbers don't have a greatest common divisor. Let's set, take 23 and 17. What you can see here is that it iterates five times, but what it eventually figures out is that the greatest common divisor is one, because one does multiply by both of those, so if you know that if the greatest common divisor is one, then they are relatively prime. And that is truly the beauty of this formula. Anyways, thank you for watching, and I want to let you know I haven't been dead, I just have been taking a break because I'm making this massive video with every math team formula you need to know, and it's going to be epic. Alright guys, I hope you come back for some more.